On Friday the 9th of November, 1888, the day on which the horrifically mutilated body of Mary Kelly was found in her tiny room, located at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street in Spitalfields, the police began taking statements from witnesses in preparation for those witnesses to be called to testify at the inquest, which was to be opened on Monday the 12th of November. Inquest witnesses were vetted by the police, and so the statements that were taken that day would have been used to determine which witnesses would be called to give evidence. This would give the coroner an idea of the type of evidence that would be presented to him and enable him to prepare questions accordingly. These witness statements have survived and are held along with the inquest papers at the London Metropolitan Archives. They provide us with an intriguing insight into the preparations being made as the investigation into Mary Kelly's death got underway. The police reports begin, Witnesses for the inquest to be opened 12th November 88 on the body of Marie Jeanette Kelly. The inquest got underway here at Shoreditch Town Hall on the morning of the 12th. Once the jury had been sworn, they were taken to view the body, which was lying in the mortuary next to Shoreditch Church, on the site now more or less occupied by this modern structure. From here they made their way to Dorset Street, where they filed into 13 Miller's Court to familiarise themselves with the crime scene. Among the reporters at the inquest that day was one from the Pall Mall Gazette, and on the evening of the 12th, his report on what he had observed appeared in the newspaper under the headline The Inquest in Whitechapel, Viewing the Body and the Room. For us today, this is as close as we are ever going to get to witnessing the immediate aftermath of a Jack the Ripper atrocity and viewing the scene at the mortuary, as well as at the location at which the murder had occurred. In addition, it also provides us with a snapshot of the reactions of the local people as they came to terms with the horror of what had happened in their midst. Before presenting the article, I will just point out that, although the reporter mentions that they made their way along the commercial road to reach Dorset Street, he did in fact mean commercial street. With that established, here is the article. The Inquest in Whitechapel, Viewing the Body and the Room, by our special reporter. The inquest on Mary Jane Kelly began this morning at 11 o'clock at Shoreditch Town Hall. There was no crowd at the doors and little excitement. Without the coroner's court, half a dozen wretched-looking women were sitting on half a dozen cane chairs waiting to be called, and for half an hour the gentlemen of the jury dropped one by one into the green-walled square little room which is sacred to the coroner. A mahogany table drawn up against the windows was laden with hats, black bags and papers belonging to the army of reporters. The jury, twelve very respectable-looking men, sat on the coroner's right, on two rows of chairs. At eleven, the coroner, Dr. MacDonald, took his seat. "'Gentlemen of the jury, stand up, please,' shouted the officer of the court. "'Will you choose a foreman, gentlemen?' "'Mr. Gobi.' "'Stand up, Mr. Gobi.' But a gentleman, I am not sure whether he was Mr. Gobi, with black gloves and a good coat, objected to serve on the jury. It wasn't in his ward. The coroner stiffened and gave them some of his mind, and Mr. Hammond again asked the jury to choose a foreman, which they did without further objection, for the coroner had evidently got his back up. "'Each kiss the book and pass it round, gentlemen, please,' cried the officer again. And these curious formalities having been observed, Dr. MacDonald's momentary wrath subsided, and he proposed that the jury should proceed to view the body and the scene of the murder. So the jury put on their hats, tightened their lips, and marched out, accompanied by a few pressmen. By this time quite a crowd had gathered around the hall, and followed us quietly to the gloomy gate of the Shoreditch Church. The little rusty iron wicket was guarded by a policeman who held it open as we passed into the melancholy churchyard with an acre of grey, soot-covered gravestones and sorrowful grass and weeds. The path ran alongside the church, and as we turned sharp round to the left there was a little brick mortuary, a red oasis in the desert of tombstones and soft, dank soil. The door was open and disclosed a cool and lofty apartment, lighted by a couple of windows placed high up, which shed a good light on the fearful spectacle upon which we were all gazing. 
There, in a coarse wooden shell, lay the body of the Ripper's latest victim. Only her face was visible. The hideous and disemboweled trunk was concealed by the dirty grey cloth, which had probably served to cover many a corpse. The face resembled one of those horrible wax anatomical specimens which may be seen in surgical shops. The eyes were the only vestiges of humanity. The rest was so scored and slashed that it was impossible to say where the flesh began and the cuts ended. And yet it was by no means a horrible sight. I have seen bodies in the Paris morgue which looked far more repulsive. The jury being quite satisfied, we marched through the church gates again and pushed our way through the crowd which followed us up the commercial road and into Dorset Street. Here another crowd held possession of the field. Frowsy women with babies in their arms, drunken men recovering from their orgies, and a whole regiment of children, all open-mouthed and commenting on the jury. The entrance to the court was held by a couple of policemen, and it was so narrow that we could only pass up in single file. It was only about three yards long, and then we were at the door, which is numbered thirteen. The two windows which look into the little court were boarded up, and had apparently been newly whitewashed. From the windows above a girl looked down upon us quite composedly, and several pots of beer were brought in during our stay to comfort the denizens of the court. At last the key was procured, and the room was surveyed in batches. The inspector, holding a candle stuck in a bottle, stood at the head of the filthy blood-stained bed and repeated the horrible details with appalling minuteness. He indicated with one hand the bloodstains on the wall, and pointed with the other to the pools which had ebbed out onto the mattress. A little table still on the left of the bedstead which occupied the larger portion of the room. A farthing dip in a bottle did not serve to illuminate the fearful gloom, but I was able to see what a wretched hole the poor murdered woman called home. The only attempts at decoration were a couple of engravings, one, the fisherman's widow, stuck over the mantelpiece, while in the corner was an open cupboard, containing a few bits of pottery, some ginger beer bottles, and a bit of bread on a plate. The rent was four shillings a week. In twenty minutes the jury filed out again, and marched back, still accompanied by a curious crowd to the town hall, and began their very simple labours under the direction of Dr. MacDonald, the member for the Scotch Crofters. Much to the surprise of many present, the inquest into Mary Kelly's death concluded that same day, and thus the jury returned their verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown that afternoon, by which time the special reporter from the Pall Mall Gazette had filed his copy, and his observations were being mulled over by readers many of whom were no doubt appalled by what his article revealed about the conditions in the district where the awful crime had occurred. <laughs>